This is Yes to Zine, the monthly magazine show about monthly magazines. We take a magazine from the golden age, play the games they like most and least, and flip through to find out what gaming was like when they took five minutes to load. And I don't just mean trying to start Forza Horizon 5 on an Xbox One. I mean loading games from cassette tapes. You know, those annoying things where people post that meme of one and a pencil and claim you're not a real gamer unless you know how they interact. And let me talk to the 20-somethings and lower in the room here. We know you know how they interact. Because there is only one possible way they could interact, and you are not a complete moron. In any case, one of the more famous machines that loaded from tape was the ZX Spectrum. And as you'll well know if you're in the retro scene, we recently lost the brain behind it, and the man it was attached to, Sir Clive Sinclair. This episode was actually planned before that, and the fact the man doesn't need another tribute is in itself tribute enough we feel. But I will note that the ZX Spectrum was my first computer, and you can count me as one of the many people from Britain and around the world who probably owe both his career and his hobby to Sir Clive's creations. One of the things often whispered though is that Sir Clive himself always rather hated what people did to his lovely machines, and never quite made peace with the fact the Spectrum is largely now remembered as a gaming device. Nonetheless, it absolutely is, and so was the focus of most of its magazines, including your Sinclair, which we first met right back in episode 5 of this show, when the Spectrum was in the prime of its life. In January 1987, your Sinclair issue 13 was published by Dennis, cost 95p, had 132 pages, and reviewed 25 new release games. By May 1992, your Sinclair issue 77 was published by Future, cost £2.20, had 68 pages, and there was a much slimmer 9 games to take a look at. While YS was still selling well, very well by today's standards, this was the month the Super NES was released in the UK, and the Mega Drive, Amiga, and even the PC were taking big and increasing bites of its cherry. And this is relevant, because your Sinclair panicked in a way I'm not sure you're going to see coming. I'll explain in the cover feature. First though, 9 games is more than enough to have a best and a worst, especially as YS had switched from out of 10 to percentage scoring. The Gaming Heaven is not one of the prime cartoon licenses, but it was one of my favourites. The Gaming Hell is a budget shooter that actually looks pretty cool from its screenshots. We shall see. But first, after all that effort, I'm going to need a little nap. Here's the thing. The cartoons you watched as kids. They seemed to run forever, didn't they? Take Racing Classic Pole Position, a show licensed from the Atari game but not actually related to it. As a child, I used to get up for school early just to watch it. I remember doing this for most of multiple school years. I don't remember seeing an episode twice. There's 13 of them total. There's no way I hadn't seen them all about 10 times each. Your brain lies to you. It's not the only one either. And Serious Cities of Gold was only 39. The famous Dungeons and Dragons cartoon just 27. Willy Fogg? 26. Dog Tanyon? 26. And the same is true of Midnight Patrol Adventures in the Dream Zone, or as we called it in the UK, Pottsworth and Company. Imagine a nice version of Nightmare on Elm Street. Midnight Patrol was about four friends and a dog who share a dream world which they have to protect from nightmares. The show was everywhere in Britain in 1990, even airing straight after school on CBBC, it got 5 million viewers. That's more than EastEnders brings in these days. The British dog that inspired the series became a celebrity. There's still only 13 episodes. Still though, the UK popularity allowed the series to get a licensed game, and it appears, given the 92% mega game review in Your Sinclair this month, they succeeded. And immediately there's some imagination here. The plot involves getting a sleeping potion for the ruler of the dream world, the Grand Dozer, who it is vitally important is allowed to sleep. In each of the five worlds, you play one of the cast of the show, each of whom have their own special abilities. And first up, it's Rosie, the girl with attitude. This attitude will be utilised by finding the five pieces of her ghetto blaster, because it's the 80s, and then using it to rescue the giant and the exit door key, both of which have been frozen in ice, because it's a cartoon. 
and it's a big level. In fact, while Rosie bimbles through the first part of it, let me show you Spectrum Computing's map of the whole level. And the other four levels are comparable. This is not going to be one of those finish it in five minutes if you know how Spectrum games. It does signal something that, outside of everything else about this game, is obvious. This is not the easy half arsing of the license that would have been very, very tempting, especially on the careening down a steep hill portion of the Spectrum's commercial lifespan. The platforming feels solid too, in a way that 8 bit titles of this era do not always do. Your character is, generally, going to go where you want her to go. You can even change direction in mid-air. This does give the impression of being a game genuinely 8 years of game development past the era of the first Dizzy and Manic Miner. It's very monochrome of course, like a heck of a lot of Spectrum games that found this the best way to avoid colour clash and keep the speed up, but it's not unattractive. That's a recognisable sprite and enemies, and there's a variety to both them and the level hazards. Which comes at a cost. While commendably for such a late era game, Pottsworth works even on a by now decade old Spectrum 48k, on that, and on the latest 1 to 8k machines, it's got a multi-load. What this means, if you're new to the Spectrum, is you start the tape and wait several minutes for the main menu, then do exactly the same to load level 1, and all the others in turn if you get there. Irritating on an emulator, even if you increase the speed, but vicious if you were to use period hardware. There's also no in-game music, just some sound effects that have come straight out of the nearest amusing fart sound generator mobile app. You'll note I've been playing one of Chris Hulsbeck's finest under this instead of the game audio. And here's why. So more Chris? I thought so. Here's the instructions for the controls. Without pressing fire, you can jump, move and crawl left and right. If you're pressing fire, you can jump, move and crawl left and right, but you're also firing. Superb work, chaps. And so this is level 1. Predictable jumping, some light traversal puzzling, and some enemies that the instructions say can be stunned with your gun or jumped on by Rosie. This unfortunately appears to be a filthy lie. The gun appears to do nothing of the sort to at least half the enemies, and outright kills the rest. And yes, you can jump on literally all of them because that's just physics, but the same enemies you can't gun will also hurt you if you jump on them. At least, unlike a lot of games of this era, we're not in the world of one hit kill. You've got a health bar, a stock of lives, and even losing a life puts you right back where you were. It does allow you to explore, and on levels this size you're absolutely going to have to. The pieces you need really are scattered far and wide. Even reaching the ice giant is going to require you to trek all the way back to the start to escape. Technically that's busy work, but I actually quite appreciate it. It feels like a complete mission similar to how modern first person open world games would handle it. Although to be fair, those would probably have some form of shortcut. And it's notable in the 16-bit version, which was ST only interestingly, that requirement is missing. I say I quite appreciate it, but you know as well as I do by this point, I couldn't manage it. Not with three lives and enemies that misbehave. There are cheats, most notably an infamous energy one, which might actually make this an interesting explorer map, and would let you discover more of the variety. Which means I need to make another aside. Because we lost a second big name from the Spectrum scene this month, Darren Piercy. Not a name you may have heard, but he ran the RZX archive, which contains recordings of Spectrum games being completed that you can even play in some supported emulators, or simply watch on YouTube. I've lent on this archive for answers on many an occasion, as has just about everyone that's ever covered a Spectrum game on YouTube, and I'm about to do so here as well. Thanks Darren. Looking at level 2, the basic gameplay is the same, sure, but now you're simply trying to climb the tower and only need to collect one item, the magic poppy, which is needed to make the grandoza go to sleep. Yeah, opiates will do that. There's less exploration and more pure traversal in this one, reflected in the controls where you can only pick up and throw objects and don't have a weapon as such. What you do have is the ability to glide in a crude double jump style and I'm not unglad I couldn't reach this level because even our intrepid RZX Archive hero is having fun with that one. Still, things continue in the subsequent levels where Pottsworth
artist child Carter and skateboarder Keiko all have fairly distinct looking gameplay. I and indeed your Sinclair are calling this a full price game, but it kinda isn't. It retailed for £7 in an era that 10 quid for cassette was absolutely becoming the more normal full price... price. There were very few people putting this kind of effort into Spectrum games at this point, and High Tech were no longer one of those people. This and the more disappointing Jetsons game, both released this issue, were their final two Spectrum releases as the company created. The quasi-internal development team that created this particular game though did survive until 2006 as a contractor, ending their life on the Game Boy Advance with the no I've never heard of it either puzzle game Tringo. Pottsworth though, while not perfect, is a remarkable last generational gem in many ways and to see this much effort and love poured into a game, even when not fully successful in all respects, is commendable. I see what your Sinclair saw in it and I would absolutely suggest playing it. It's 1992. The ZX Spectrum is, to be blunt, a dead format. Literally in fact, 1992 is the year they discontinued making the machines. And you've just seen how even using a major cartoon license and writing genuinely the best thing released that month is not enough to stop a game killing a publisher. While your Sinclair's published circulation figure is nearly 60,000, the way it works is those figures are for the last complete six month period. And at the point of this issue, published late in the next cycle, Future would have known the real sales figures were already down by a third. And another six months will see them lose a full half of those remaining. We're already less than 18 months from the magazine, by then the last Spectrum one, closing. Even in this issue, a gigantic warning sign as their two competitors, Crash and Sinclair User, merged, leaving just this and them on the shelves. So what do you do? Even with a smaller page count, there's rapidly getting to the point where there just isn't enough New Spectrum stuff to cover. Your Sinclair spiritual successor, Amiga Power, handled this by going weird, once devoting 14 of one of their 68 page issues to entirely non-games related paranormal coverage. But your Sinclair went another way. They decided to launch a lifestyle section called The World. Editor Andy Hutchinson was remarkably candid about it. You could well be wondering why we're bothering with stuff about books, films and records in YS. The reason's actually quite simple. There's little else to write about. So few games are coming out for the specy these days that we decided to look to other areas of life in order to keep you lot informed and to keep the issues as large as possible. The world is quite probably going to be the future of YS. So, if you love us and you don't want to see us go the way of other magazines, then carry on reading. On the face of it, I've heard worse ideas. Later this year, Future would launch SNES Mag Superplay, and that was always a culture magazine on their side too, reviewing books and devoting space to anime right from this, its first issue. Crucially though, they related this book back to games. The books were gaming related and they followed up the anime introduction in issue 1 with an anime game special in issue 2. And they did commit to it. In fact, the very last piece of editorial in the original run of Superplay was anime video reviews. But what of the world in your Sinclair? Well, it takes up five pages towards the end of the magazine, beginning with video reviews. And in what I feel is an immediate catastrophic misstep, their first one is Silence of the Lambs, an 18 certificate. Maybe your Sinclair knows their readership demographics better than I do, but I'd wager that by 1992, the over 18s are not, by and large, still using a ZX Spectrum. I'm pretty confident in that wager too, if only by the general look of the rest of the magazine, which very much skews towards the comic compared to the look of, well, let's use Superplay again. There's a couple of 15s here too, and while I could perhaps see Look Who's Talking be vaguely relevant, I'm not sure Flatliners is a win. Or a good film. The TV seems more spot on, or maybe I'm just projecting the habits of 11 year old me here, because Red Dwarf and Doctor Who would be a pretty good shout. These are though, 4 year old episodes of Red Dwarf, 
and there hadn't been Doctor Who at all for three years at the time of writing. So their complaint in the editor's letter about reviewing old games releases seem a smidge hollow if you're going to review four-year-old TV. I also can't shake the realisation that I'm saying they've targeted this pretty well for 11-year-old me when 11-year-old me got an Amiga this month. Weirdly, having spent a page just talking about videos, we suddenly start to actually review things, starting with a single video review, giving Kids Video Spider 9 out of 10 broadly for reasons of Linda Barker liking spiders. The music is going to be trickier. I've heard of exactly one of these groups, and if I play you any of them, then YouTube is probably going to really let me know it's heard of them. So let's just content ourselves with pointing out that of the eight top singles they release here, precisely one of them ever ended up making the top 40, and that was at 32. The book selection on page 3 is a similar mixed bag, giving Jurassic Park 5 out of 10 might be fair for all I know having never read the book itself, but given the movie was a year out, feels like it wouldn't have dated super well. Next, Usborne produced several brilliant Spectrum related books. You can actually download them for free. Better Basic was one of my first programming books, and I know others have very similar memories of computer space games and computer battle games. Your Sinclair celebrate this by reviewing how to draw cartoons. They've obviously got a bit of a bundle from Usborne, because the entire rest of the section is them. And while we wonder why we have so many Usborne books, we also get the answer, a tie-in competition to win them. To be fair though, several of these books were kinds of game from a publisher of computing books, so at least so far that section isn't a complete disaster. Maybe the fourth of our five pages will be something game related. No. Granted it's time appropriate, but video game and home computer magazine Your Sinclair devotes a page of its May 1992 issue to reviewing easter eggs. I'm not sure what to tell you here, except that they're right, mini eggs are pretty damn cool. Which is probably why they're pretty much the only product here that survives in vaguely recognisable form to this day since they ruined cream eggs a few years back. And what I'm really doing here is delaying the next move, because there is one page left and I've already looked at it. So in this video games magazine for video gamers, we've reviewed films, games, books and chocolate. What's missing? What else should be in their rest of the world section? I'll give you the length of the intro music of Sonic Spinball on the Mega Drive to decide. Didn't see that one coming, did you? I remind you, this is a ZX Spectrum magazine about ZX Spectrum games, on the ZX Spectrum. I don't think I can explain how bad this section is. I don't think there are words. I don't think the words in the section explain how bad the section is. If this section was in just 17 or looking, it would be mocked for all time. But this, I remind you, is your Sinclair, a Sinclair magazine about computing on Sinclair machines with Sinclair written on them. But you know, since we're here, let's get some highlights. Other signs that a chap's attracted to someone include highlighting the middle of the trousers with the thumbs. This is saying, check me out. A man may also stand with his hands on his hips to accentuate his Burton's trousers. The women's section is not better. Women enjoy tossing their hair. Look at her hands. Is she fondling a cylindrical object, such as the stem of a glass or a cigarette? Oh, we're not done. They've also done a list of ways to find out if someone is attracted to you, and see if you can spot the exact moment they lost all confidence in the project. Ask them if they fancy you. Ask a friend to ask them if they fancy you. Ask yourself if they've been following you around for days. Have they tried to snog you? Are you already going out with them? Or indeed are married to them? Have items of your underwear been disappearing off the clothesline lately? Bloody hell. And with that, we're out of the section. 
Not that you'd know that reading the magazine until you turn the page again, and an advert for Total Mouse and Graphics package for your Spectrum makes it very clear you are in fact apparently reading some sort of computing magazine for computers that turn maths into gameplay. Somehow, the section soldered on. Although, after two articles about the basic concept of summer, the renamed Flip part of the magazine was reduced to three pages and started restricting itself purely to media. Issue 82 chopped it to just a pair of pages, and six months after its introduction removed the branding entirely and featured just half a page of its least embarrassing section, the news-focused Killer Column, which lasted right up until issue 92, the magazine's last regular one. So what does a games magazine do when mortality stares it in the face? It changes into FHM Junior, apparently. Yesterzine could run for a very, very long time before we find something worse than this. And we've played Count Duckula too. And we've also played our gaming hell for this month, Q10 Tank Buster. Q10 Tank Buster is from Zeppelin, a long-term peddler of Spectrum games of varying quality. But that quality does not always match the reviews they got. Earlier this year, you may recall this very show covering an issue of rival Spectrum magazine Crash, where the gaming hell was a charming single-screen shooting game 2088. It got panned by Crash, but I rather liked it for its speedy action and simple high score mechanic. Zeppelin's remaining back catalogue is, to put it mildly, variable. A lot of which porting jobs for others, like Sleepwalker. All the kind of stuff just not quite imaginative enough for Codemasters to touch, such as Go-Kart Simulator and Professional Go-Kart Simulator, but also Neighbours on all the major formats, widely considered to be one of the worst things ever committed to tape, disc or just generally committed. And unlike Potsworth, Q10 is a genuine budget release at four English pounds, and the presentation reflects that. We're back to the 48k beeper sound and sparse menus here. That said, the benefit of this is there's no damn multi-load at least. But that beeper, such beeper. And then we're in the game and Q10 Tank Buster is a brave thing to do on a Spectrum, a horizontally scrolling shooter a genre that by nature involves a lot of things being thrown about a screen. Not just the enemies, but also the bullets and any scenery. And all this needs to be done at speed while still making your controls work. Because if there is any kind of game where I'm going to need my controls to work, this is going to be it. And initially you will note I'm struggling here. Partly, of course, because I am awful at shooting games and even more awful at the horizontal ones, even accounting for grading on the general curve of me being pretty awful at most games. But the thing is, it's at least mostly not the game. Much like the earlier 2088 did, this pre-redeems itself by the ship doing exactly what I want the ship to do when I want it to do it. Like many early shooting games, it fires only as fast as you hammer the button, and I know that's divisive, with me landing firmly on the side of not being a fan, but it works. The only slight clunkiness in the controls is your bombs. There's no button for them. They get dropped by you pressing down, which of course means that like your mum, you drop bombs when going down. And you have to be really accurate with those bombs to actually hit things, so I largely gravitated towards just trying to avoid the bullets rather than target the ground enemies specifically. Your other early game nemesis is going to be the cargo plane. He appears early, and often, and is difficult to hit, something of a bullet sponge, and when he gets bored of that, pings around the map making him really difficult to avoid. I burned a lot of lives on him. But if you get him, you start to get bonuses. And I persevered with the game, and I did get better, and I did get bonuses. The first one being a triple shot that's even more impressive on the spectrum, and very effective. Even if you lose it the second you miss a stray bullet coming off the ground. While pondering this had quite a lot in common with 2088, I remembered something else. In that game, I got a lot further once I transferred the controls to an Xbox 360 joypad rather than trying to retrain my fingers to deal with QA, O and P. Same works here too, but of course it means it immediately invites comparisons with games on the 8-bit consoles of the time. 
And you know what? It holds up surprisingly well in all respects except the immediate graphics. Because while it's impressive doing all this on the Spectrum, while the game itself is fun, there's a near fatal flaw that all this going on means it's really difficult to see where those bullets are coming from. And the play area is smaller and more cluttered than most games, meaning dodging is difficult when you inevitably see them late. Traditionally on Yes Scene, I don't actually read the magazine reviews until I've at least played a game in an attempt not to be swayed too much. And I did that here. I mention that because if you don't trust me, you'd read that review and think I didn't even play the game. Because they say exactly what I do. But it's their conclusion that's interesting. They actually like the game, but their score affecting problem is that the game is repetitive, that it's got no lasting appeal, that it is, to quote, one of those load it, play it, bin it games. And I have two problems with this. Firstly, is it though? Is it more so than any other game like it? Is it more so than R-Type or than Ridge Racer even? It's an arcade game a high-score attack game. I don't see that criticism in itself being any more valid and applicable to this than I literally do to any other shooting game of the era. Does that in itself warrant a 39% review of a game that costs £4? Maybe. Maybe I see the function of these games differently. Mostly a budget game would have been something you could broadly get without too much thought. The kind of thing that could be picked up on a whim on a shopping trip that included the local boots. It's why boots stocked them. And as I said with 2088, if this was your half-term entertainment, you would absolutely get the value out of the thing. If you're on Twitter, you've probably seen 8BitBoy do his Master System challenges every week, and often those are score attack games like this. If he did Spectrum games, then not only would his challenge be badly misnamed, but this would be a perfectly good candidate. In 2021, it's even better. You and me are not spending £4 on this. We're firing it up on an emulator, and even if you're a shooting fan, I'm guessing that an obscure late-era Spectrum budget release is something you might not have heard of. Give it a go one evening when you fancy a load it to play at Binit game. On the back page, more YouTube channels than you can stake a stick at and certainly more than I expected when I worked backwards from a pun to come up with a collaborative internet series idea. Retro gaming has got expensive, even ignoring those that think putting a perfectly common game in an extra plastic box should somehow immediately make it worth actual money, rather than, in reality, making it a now useless game in a bit of Tupperware. Games are getting expensive. Genuinely rare stuff, like Sonic Spinball on the Saga Master Saster, can and do sell for hundreds. But if you look closely, gaming can still be cheap. In fact, most of us had games we paid but £1 for, and we're going to all show them to you in a series we are calling Quid Game. I'm very sorry. We started last week on this very channel with Pimp My Ride MTV European Street Racing on PS2. But you'll already find entries on the channels of my good friend Bloggo and the ageless and 16 times cleverer than she will ever admit Daphne Blake, with many more to come. Keep an eye on the description or the end of this very video and I'll post our playlist and you can enjoy many hours of gaming for less than the price of even real Tupperware. And I'll let you do that, pausing only to hit likes, subscribes, bells, cherries, nook miles and large number sevens while I go and see if I can find my way into the dream zone. Cheery bye!